I'm Jack Chase. I'm class of 98. So for those of you counting at home, that's I'm 36 years old. And when I was here, this was not remodeled, and Tyrannosaurus Rex was still roaming the plains outside. So um, I'm a doctor at San Francisco General Hospital. I'm a family physician, um, and I take care of patients who are hospitalized. And I also take care of patients at the end of life. I do something called palliative care. And I'm a teaching doctor, so I, I work as part of UCSF, and um, uh, that's who writes my checks. And uh, uh, I teach uh, doctors in training, so I teach family doctors in training how to do the care that I do. Um, and I went to college at Harvard, and then I actually came back to San Francisco and I taught public high school, admission high school, and I coached the soccer team, I taught science. Um, and then I realized that uh, what I liked doing was working with smaller groups of people around issues of science and, and how to um, kind of help them make it real, uh, make it relevant. And so that's kind of what led me to med school. Um, and I advice, boy, that's a tough one. Um, I think, you know, do what you're passionate about. Explore widely, um, try things out. Don't be afraid to try something and have a, a failure or a, a something that you don't end up liking, because actually the negative results are probably as positive as the positive results in the end, because it helps you to get to the, the ultimate path where you're going. And thanks for having me. My name's Kelly Johnson, and I graduated from UHS in 94, so that makes me 40. Um, I went on to Middlebury College in Vermont, where I studied sociology and art history, and I very much credit Prudy and Doc Lamont and the amazing Western Civ curriculum for giving me a taste of that stuff, um, which has become a lifelong passion. Um, after I graduated with my BA in those two um, subject areas, I went, I kind of fell into advertising. Um, I was not very good about pursuing uh, internships during my summers. I worked at a coffee shop, I rented jet skis to people, <laughs> I did a lot of fun stuff, um, but none of it would have been deemed um, resume builders. But I was lucky nonetheless um, to, to land an internship after I graduated because I was convinced no one would hire me without any marketable skills. Um, but since then, <laughs> I've done all right for myself. I'm currently the president of a small advertising agency in San Francisco. We're called 215 McCann, and we're owned by a really big advertising agency who are the bad guys in Mad Men, <laughs> if you guys watch that show. <laughs> um, but I've had a wonderful career in advertising that, again, I kind of chanced into. And so I'd say, if I had any advice to give you guys, I would say, pursue the stuff you love, and your job will follow. Um, I think you're a generation that will benefit more than any generation before you in terms of figuring out the really interesting, niche nuanced jobs that exist in the world and how to find them. So I wouldn't be overly concerned, especially in high school or even in college, with how you're going to pay your bills and pay your rent. Your parents will get you out of the house someday, but you'll find it if you really kind of go after the stuff you're interested in. So thanks for having me. Hi, I'm Eric Sparks. I'm a vice president in the investment banking division at Goldman Sachs. I graduated from UHS in 1999. I went to UC Davis. Uh, after graduating from college, I was in the Army for seven years. Uh, I was an aviation officer and an attack helicopter pilot. Um, lived in a number of different places. Spent about two and a half years in Baghdad. After getting out of the Army, I went to Harvard Business School for my MBA and uh, I've been working at Goldman Sachs since graduating from there in 2013. Uh, I have a wife uh, and two kids. My wife is a doctor at UCSF. She works down in Mission Bay. My daughter is four and a half and starting at SF Day this upcoming fall. Nice. We're excited too. And, uh, and my son is two and he's starting at the Scandinavian school, which is a preschool uh, up near us uh, also this fall. So we're excited about that. Uh, I'll probably give you a little bit different advice than what I expect from most of the rest of the panelists. Um, for a career in finance, uh, it's not necessary to be directive from sort of day one of starting in college, but it does help. Um, you, you need to be focused and because there are lots of people who are. Uh, people who get internships in finance after their freshman year, after their sophomore year, and you know, I can tell you that if you're sitting in front of me for an interview between your junior, for an internship between your junior and senior year, if that's the first moment that you've expressed any interest in finance, it's probably not going to go that well. 
so you know, being prepared and having spent some time uh, in the arena is helpful. Um, and I say that because honestly, every year I talk to a UHS grad who is looking to get into finance, um, and it just doesn't work if you don't have a track record uh, of wanting to pursue that. So again, limited for, for those folks who are, are interested in finance, but, uh, and I think the rest of the advice is, is great, just want to kind of add uh, that little niche uh, and spin onto things. Thanks. Hi everyone, my name is Jen Massey. I was UHS class of 95. I then went to Wesleyan, which I highly recommend if you're still trying to decide. Um, graduated there in 99 um, with a degree in Latin American studies. Uh, partially, the interest in which was partially fueled by my strong language background that um, started at MCDS and then was furthered here at, at UHS, um, both in French and Spanish. I somehow successfully wriggled my way out of any physics or higher level math classes in order to take double languages my junior and senior year here, which I'm grateful for in the end. Um, and then I didn't know what I wanted to do with my life because Latin American studies is super interesting but not really a marketable job skill. So I went to culinary school for six months in New York City and then I did a bunch of random jobs before I realized that my true passion was actually social work and I fled back to California and got my master's in social work at Cal in 2004. Um, after which I was a case manager for or service coordinator, if you want to call it that, for ki little kids under three with developmental disabilities for 11 years. Um, then due to a bunch of life circumstances, I went back to grad school and got a second master's degree, um, which I finished last year, six weeks before my son was born. Um, and now I'm staying at home with him for a bit. I think, in the end, for social work, unlike perhaps for finance, where you go to school isn't as important as what you learn and who you learn it from. Um, because out of all my former coworkers, some of them, like me, went to sort of big name schools like Cal or UCLA or, you know, even Smith has a really good social work school. But some of them just went to, you know, SF State or you know, Cal State East Bay or wherever, and we all did exactly the same work and were just as passionate about it. Um, so I guess in the long run, what, I, what started here at UHS for me was this sort of sense of inquiry and, and love of learning that was really fostered here and that carried me through my personal and professional careers. So I would say that even if you know from day one, for example, that you want to go into finance, go for it. I had a classmate at Wesleyan who did that. He was also on the football team and in a fraternity and was an actor in theater productions. So take advantage of those other opportunities. And um, you know, the more opportunities you give yourself, I think, the more options you have later on. And that's just been great for me. Thank you. Uh, hi, I'm Lizzie Hammerman. I am class of 1998. I'll let you guys do the math on my age. Um, and I graduated from UHS. I went to Stanford, um, did a undergrad, um, bachelor's degree and master's degree in chemical engineering. From there, I graduated and I kind of followed the chemi path and went into um, product development for pharmaceuticals. So I've worked at a bunch of different companies, done a bunch of different kinds of um, pharma de development. Did that for about 14 years, or, and continue to do it, um, but have recently scaled back in the last year and a half to a part-time basis. And then I spend the other part-time, but really full-time, um, doing business development for a fitness studio, actually. So um, I help franchise for um, a studio based out of Menlo Park in Los Altos called Alkaline Studios, finding new franchisees, getting the system set up, and helping them be successful sort of across the US. So we just opened a studio in um, Grand Rapids, Michigan, of all places, which was pretty phenomenal. Um, so as far as advice for you guys, I would say the biggest thing is to always be a student, that your learning does not end with your diploma or your degree. 
Um, if I think about the people who I'm still friends with from UHS, and I actually stay in touch with a lot of them, um, a lot of them are in fields that didn't exist when they were sitting in your chairs. So whether that's artificial intelligence, social media, I was just telling these guys, I was in college when I got my first cell phone. Um, so the importance of learning and always kind of keeping your skills fresh will make you super versatile and give you a lot of flexibility in whatever it is you wanna do. All right, thanks. Hi, good afternoon. I'm Ann Fung. I am the class of 89, which means I've been a graduate almost 28 years ago. Well, it sounds like a long time ago, but it goes really fast. So if there's nothing you, you know, other than that that you take home, enjoy it. It's an amazing path, and these friendships that you've made with each other, with your teachers, really lasts you a lifetime. I am currently a retina specialist who practices here at CPMC, and then I also am a group medical director at Genentech, leading some of the late stage science in ophthalmology. How did I get here? I went to Wellesley College after graduating here, and I majored in Chinese studies. I was interested in understanding what looking like this really meant, having been th third generation born here. I also have a minor in economics, and because Chinese studies is an interdisciplinary major, I was able to use my elective time to do my pre-med requirements. So there's a few different ways that you can get to graduate schools without majoring in a hard science. Um, after that, I felt like I had a lot of book knowledge but not practical knowledge, so I went to Hong Kong. And I knew that I wanted to just live there and get to know my heritage better for about one or two years. And I thought, well, if you move to a city and you really want to know what's going on, you work in the media. So I ended up doing marketing and promotions for an English language newspaper there for two years. Realized that I too wanted to be a little closer to people and make a difference one-on-one. -on -one. So I applied to medical school from Hong Kong, came back and forth for the interviews, and did my training in New York City. Again, intentional because people who are in Hong Kong often travel to New York so I could keep up with those friendships. Um, then residency at Stanford, my fellowship in Miami, and I agree that it's where you, where you go to college and, and graduate school make a difference, but the polish on your ultimate direction is in the last stages of your training. So fellowship was what set me on a path to be fascinated by macular degeneration. It's um, something that affects people over the age of 60 and can really have a major impact when they can't see. I am married, I have two kids, three and five, for the young women, and actually for, for everyone in the room, trying to figure out how you weave your family into your life, however, whatever complexion that takes, is a really interesting path. It sometimes never seems like there's time to do the personal stuff, but it can be done. So um, my advice is, I agree, do what you love, let your heart lead you in that direction because your heart leads you to really be curious and to want to learn more. I was so lucky to have been here to take Latin. I sang in Camerata, I did theater, played tennis. You know, just do all the different things and push yourself because you never know what, Lord knows, the future is gonna be something quite different than what we're living right now. <laughs> Thanks. Hi, my name is Haruko Gaim, and I'm an immigration attorney, and I have my own practice in Oakland. I'm a solo practitioner with, um, I'm an office of four, and all of us are women in my office, and that just happened recently, and it makes me really proud that I am in a position to be able to hire and hire persons that I want, and uh, that happened because of everything that I learned when I was at UHS. I graduated in 1997 after uh, I went to Cal. Then I came back to UHS and worked uh, at Summerbridge for two years. Uh, also another great program because I came to UHS through Summerbridge. I'm sure a lot of you are familiar. Yeah, okay. actually um, love Summerbridge, love UHS, um, and I 
hope to continue to support Summer Bridge because I think it's a very important program uh, for UHS, vice versa. Uh, after two years of that, I went to USF uh, Law School, graduated from there and worked at the Department of Justice for a couple of years and then I founded my own office kind of accidentally and I've been doing that for the last nine years. Uh, but a little bit about what you said, I am uh, originally from East Africa, and when I was at Cal, uh, Cal has a study abroad program, and I was an African American and history major, uh, double major, and I combined those two so that I could learn about the history of uh, certain African countries, specifically Eritrea and Eastern um, countries, because I'm my family's from East Africa, and when I got there, I got to learn Tigrinya, which is the language spoken in my uh, language, and that uh, propelled me to open my office, and my clients are mostly East African, and one of the assets is the fact that I am completely fluent, and that is an asset because uh, people feel comfortable. Uh, people. Uh, my office actually does not advertise. I'm a word of mouth office for the last nine years because uh, people com feel comfortable when they're able to speak to me directly. And I see the difference in that because when I have other clients that I don't speak the same language with, they're more comfortable with my interpreter. I say that to say learning a language is an asset for you no matter what, and learning other cultures is an asset no matter what, no matter what field you're in. So my advice to you would be um, keep your options open, uh, be willing to uh, learn everything. I think someone said that. Be willing and open to learn because you don't know what direction your, <laughs> your life will take you in because this is not what I imagined I'd be doing when I was at UHS. I was definitely influenced by Tucker. I don't know if you guys know Tucker, but he did Amnesty International. You guys, yeah, you guys, yes, you guys might remember, but he, um, was a teacher here and he talked about Amnesty International a lot. At that time, I didn't have the same knowledge about Amnesty International that I do now, but it always stuck with me. Um, and so now that I use their resource, it's important to just keep an open mind. All right, um, my name is Eric Fisher. I just want to say thanks to Mariana for, for organizing this. It's also interesting to hear their, their alums talking. Um, so I graduated class of 99 with Eric Sparks um, at Goldman Sachs. I'm actually at the Federal Reserve and Bank, Bank of San Francisco, where I'm an economist and um, I do stress testing. So I look at how our financial system would behave in a, another financial crisis. Um, so we create scenarios and then we see what happens to the banks in those scenarios. And um, how did I get here? And in addition to that, I do research, so go to conferences and present work that we, we're doing. Um, so after UHS, I, I, um, so I was really interested in international relations and economics, so I went to Georgetown University for the School of Foreign Service. And uh, while I was there, I did a lot of different things, but um, was really interested in going overseas and having a foreign service career. Took the foreign service exam. I thought I would spend a little bit of time overseas um, but uh, I was talking to some people and I, I just made the decision that I wanted to continue my education and I needed to really think about whether this was the right move. Um, ended up getting my master's degree in economics uh, here at the University of San Francisco and um, eventually going and getting my PhD in economics at UC Santa Cruz. And when I, when I got my PhD, um, and for those thinking about getting a PhD, I was never thinking about getting a PhD in your shoes, but um, I, I thought, okay, I'm going to do development economics, and that was an area that I was really interested in because I, I studied a little bit in my master's and my undergrad, and, and I thought, well, maybe you get a PhD in this. Um, but but I, I, I just took different courses, and it's similar to UHS, and, and all along your educational career, you sort of get interested in, you might think you're interested in one thing, and then for whatever reason, you're taking a class with somebody else and they really inspire you. And I took like a series of courses in monetary economics and macroeconomics, and suddenly I, I got more interested in that. 
Um, and I was confused because I thought, okay, look, I want to do development, but I'm not so interested in that. What do I do now? And, uh, and I ended up doing a dissertation on monetary policy and um, financial crises. I taught my own course in financial crises. And I went on the job market and had a lot of interviews. And I guess my point is just keep, keep an open mind, even when you're in a narrow field, to maybe thinking if something doesn't feel right, try something else. And just keep an open mind. And I think that's something other people have talked about. Because at the end of the day, you're going to end up with something um, after your education that hopefully you'll love doing. Which I, I, and, I, and the other piece of advice I have is it's not just what you do, it's also who you work with and who you're with. Um, like for me, and where I work, I love going to work because I love the people I work with. And, and I think that that is really important. It's, it's also important what you do, and you have to enjoy that too. But I think also working with people you enjoy working with is, is really, really important. And it's hard to know that, um, you know, but you'll, you'll feel it, I think, when you interview or when you go out in the market and try maybe different opportunities, whether it be internships or other opportunities that you have along the way. I actually have a question about getting your first internship. Um, you have no experience, presumably. So how do you get about? How do you go about convincing someone that they should hire you and not someone else? I think it's a little different in social work than it is in some other fields like economics or finance or maybe even medicine. For me internships were woven into the fabric of my graduate degree, so I had the assistance of the professors um, in finding them, but as far as why me and not you, or whoever else, you know, um, I think it's a matter of being comfortable with yourself as a person and knowing what your skills are and being comfortable talking about them. And no matter what your profession is, you kind of need to have an elevator pitch. You know, a 30 second or 60 second thing that you can say promoting yourself. And if you need to practice for 10 hours in front of your cat and the hallway mirror, then that's what you need to do. And the more comfortable you are with yourself and your skills, the more that shows to someone else and then they can be confident in you. Again, narrowly sort of in finance are a couple of different ways. One, a lot of schools are pretty structured uh, about getting internships, so there are application processes and it's one of the reasons actually how, how finance gets its sort of pipeline of people into it is like at this point in your life, you're pretty good at filling out applications. And so we just make you continue to fill out applications and you end up with a career in finance. Um, but also it's through who you know. Uh, if you have family relationships, a lot of times, not surprisingly, parents are very helpful. At, you know, they know people who work at small PE shops or different you know, hedge funds, VC firms around here, like whatever, and they can kind of take on a, a summer internship or a summer intern um, pretty simply, pretty easily, and then that just kind of gets you and, and it's fairly self-perpetuating at that point. But it's a good question because it's really important. Um, I work in advertising and I'd say generally in marketing, um, the interns are, we look at interns more from an attitudinal perspective than from a skill set perspective because often they're very junior, they don't have much experience or really starting in a field. So what we typically look for is a positive attitude, optimism, kind of a real work ethic and a hunger and an ability to be resourceful. An intern is not helpful to me if I ask them to do something and they come back to me and say, sorry, I couldn't get it done, didn't know how. I need those people to like ask the questions, make friends, get some help from some peers, get some help from some other people um, in the agency. So I think more than anything, I look for kind of a general disposition for people that are hungry, interested to learn, and just kind of nice to be around, <laughs> frankly. Yeah, so I just would add to um, what Eric was saying. Uh, for like at the Federal Reserve, um, you know, we take college students when there's not a hiring freeze, um, but we do take college students that don't, are interested in, in, work, in working at the Fed. And I think internships are a great way to see both from the employer side, but also from the applicant side, is that something that they want to pursue later on? Um, and in terms of getting one, uh, I would say having that can-do attitude um, and being able to, I mean, not making coffee, you're going to be like doing things, but sometimes it won't be the most fascinating. You're not going to be deciding interest rates from day one. So you're going to be doing the grunt work, like whatever it is that has to get done. And if you show that you show like that's what you want to do. Like I remember in college, I worked at some office and I was organizing files and putting them in binders. But 
I, I think on the resume, it showed up as boutique consulting firm. And, 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 and I think that there's, and, and the reality was I was managing the office, like post person coming, but there's a lot of logistical things that has to get done. And if you just have that can-do attitude, it's gonna be that stepping, like that little start that you're gonna eventually hopefully move on, yeah. Uh, Enterprise for high school students was really a great foundation for finding local internships so you could have an opportunity this summer. Um, then it is perhaps who your friends and family know, but it is how you show up at that interview. Not just, I can do it, but I actually have some idea as to what you do, what I, you know, you know what you're asking for helps a tremendous amount because if your mom or dad makes an introduction for you and you just should go like, hi, I don't really know anything about a doctor's office and I'm really not interested in people or patients, mm -hmm. it just doesn't, I don't understand why you're there and it makes for a really long summer. <laughs> so sometimes I've had to ask during that interview, do you really want to be here? And unless there's a resounding like, yes, you know, I want to learn this or accomplish this, it doesn't make sense. So yes, if you need a connection, but then you need to really want it and then know how to figure things out on your own, which you've learned very well here, right? I actually think one of the things that I wish that I had learned earlier is how to have a sense of humility about myself, which isn't to say that I like walk around and tell everyone how great I am all day long, but to actually be able to, especially when you're in challenging conversations, and that happens a lot in my line of work, um, having hard conversations with people about the illness that they have or about what's happening in their life, um, to, to kind of have a sense of the privilege that I have in those conversations and to, to be aware of what I have to offer to people and also to be humble about those things, to be grateful about those things. A lot of the patients that um, I take care of, probably similar to the, the clients that Haragu has, are um, a very diverse group of people that um, have very different lives than probably most of us in this room lead. We may have family members that lead lives that are similar, but um, you know, they don't have all the privileges. A lot of the people that I take care of are homeless, are struggling with substance use disorders, have been victims of violence, are um, first generation immigrants to San Francisco or to the United States and don't have a lot of advantages. And so kind of being able to um, meet people where they're at is really, really important. Um, and to be kind of internally to acknowledge the, the, the privilege that we have and to use that to try to help other people. UHS, when I was here, was great about teaching you how to make a point and make it forcefully. Uh, and I think a lot of times, at least when I was in the army and with my soldiers who maybe were not educated, barely graduated high school, what it came off as sort of self-righteous. And, um, and that was an issue and something that I kind of continue to work on because now I give people advice for a living. Um, and so and it's just something to, to think about and it's something that I actually think about a lot, uh, particularly as my kids are, are starting to enter into to education and you know how do you balance being able to be strong in your convictions, but letting everyone know that you're open to changing your mind. So um, I want to turn it on its head. One thing that I thought was really good at UHS was the integrated learning that we had going on in Western Civ and some of the other classes we had, um, and the ability to work across different lines and feeling like you'd be pretty good at it. I, I never felt I was the best person in my class. Like I never felt like I stood out, but I did the best I could, and I knew that I got something out of it. Um, but one thing, and I think this is something that um, maybe is not UHS, but also college, is you know our world is changing, and we won't know. I think one of the other speakers mentioned we won't know what it'll be like down the road. But one thing that I see now that um, is we're becoming more technology-based and computer science courses. And I never took a computer science course. I think they, uh, Jim Bowlby, who was the computer science person here, um, and I remember Eric Sparks. You were always down there playing on the computers. Uh, with, with, with Karuna and some other guys. Um, I, I, w I could do word processing and a few things, and I have had to learn that stuff in my own dissertation, but I think that you know, the skills of being able to program and that language, if that's even in economics and finance, and that 
just having that understanding of how to program a computer, it might not be that exciting. I don't think I was drawn to it, but that was something I felt like that would be good to have. Um, yeah. And, and so interestingly, I took an independent study my senior year, second half of my senior year, in programming, because that's what I wanted to do in college, and I figured out I absolutely hated it. And <laughs> I did you know, completely the opposite from that. So right, it's a great point. At what point in your lives do you feel like adults? Yeah, so the question is, at what point in your life do you feel like an adult? Um, I'll let you know when I get there. Um, you know, I, I still don't know what I want to be when I grow up. You know, I... Um, and, but every day is an adventure, and it's fun. And when th you know, and just to be able to pivot and do different things and learn different things has been awesome. Like the the pseudo career change I made about a year ago has been honestly one of the best things I've ever done. Um, and it took a lot of guts. You know, I don't have two degrees in Stanford to teach fitness classes. You know, to get over my own ego and to be okay with, but but this is what I love, and this is really fun. Um, and I also justify it as it, you know, I, I do more than teach. I, you know, I do a bunch of the stuff on the business side. But um, just to let go of all the preconceived notions and expectations out there and do what I enjoy. Um, and to be a kid, having fun doing it. You know, and that's okay. I think there's a big difference between being an adult and being a grown-up, and I hope I never become a grown-up. Um, I think I started to feel like an adult when I had my master's degree and bought my house. Um, and I had a car that the loan was paid off and I adopted a dog and didn't kill her with my neglect. Um, I, I don't mean that flippantly. It, it's just, you know, I, I felt like I'd sort of achieved certain expected milestones, but it's going to be different for everyone, right? And maybe because I'm a kid at heart or maybe because I worked with kids under three for so long and now I have a six-month-old and I kind of, you know, basically make fart noises to make him laugh... I don't think I'm ever going to be a grown-up, which to me sort of implies being stagnant and, and losing that spirit of learning. So maybe, again, just to provide some counterexamples. I mean, I spent most of my 20s in combat, so I felt pretty adult-like that whole time. Yeah. Um, I work in marketing, so we talk a lot about different generations and attitudes and cultural mores and all, all kinds of stuff, but there is this new notion which is called hashtag adulting with an ING on the end, Gerund. Um, and the idea is that there, there used to be a very linear path to becoming an adult. You graduated high school, you went to college if you were lucky enough to do so, graduated, you got married, you had kids, you bought a house. Um, you wrote a will, all that kind of stuff. And now the world and the people in this world are, much, are approaching things in a much more organic fashion and there is no linear path to becoming an adult anymore and I think that is fantastic because I think we're far too diverse. There's far too many experiences that people are having in all different kinds of orders um, that you know, for me in my life there have been moments where I'm like, oh my gosh, I just bought a condo, oh my goodness, you know. I wrote a will, or I had a, a lawyer write a will for me. Um, but I hope never to be an adult like Jen. I, I hope, or grown up, I hope to kind of just continue to live my life and feel like I can relate to young people and old people and all the people in between. So keep on adulting. <laughs> um, so my, the, the year that I taught at Mission High School, uh, my students were really interested in knowing how old I was. And I had just graduated college, so I was 22. And uh, they were 18, a lot of them. Yeah. And uh, so one day, uh, m most of the way through the year, we, we got into a discussion about how old I was. And I wouldn't tell them, but I was, you know, how old do you think I am? Was, 27, 35, someone calls out, 56 from the back <laughs> row, you know. <laughs> and uh, and I, I actually, I was like desperately hoping that they wouldn't figure out that I was by far the youngest member of the faculty at the school. I mean, like by at least five years. Um, and then one day, a student of mine came sort of in confidence to me at lunch and said, you know, Mr. Chase, like, um, I got my girlfriend pregnant and I need to drop out of school and get a job. Can you help me? And I, at that moment, I was like, oh man, I am totally not an adult. Like, this guy is going through stuff that's far more challenging than what I do every day. And so I think that's kind of been a theme in my life, honestly. I, I, don't, I don't know that I feel like an adult so much as that I just have developed skills over time to try to help people through hard situations. And that process of knowing myself and what I have to offer people and being honest about that 
is empowering, and maybe that's part of being an adult. Um, but I don't know that there was like a moment in time when it flipped. I think it's more kind of been about um, being able to be honest about what I have to offer to people and have sometimes have hard conversations and sometimes to kind of bear witness to what people are going through. Um, and to be open to learning uh, is a really big thing. I think feeling self-confident enough to admit when you're wrong or to admit when you don't know something and then be open to the, what people have to teach you, even if they come from really different backgrounds, um, is a really important skill. I, I think I felt like an adult when I was responsible for the consequences of my actions. I deal with uh, people's lives all the time, and so no matter what happens, I have to be open and available and responsible for everything that I do. And so, uh, and I, I'm, maybe I'm not trying to uh, hide from the word adult, <laughs> but um, I felt like an adult uh, when I knew that that's what I had to do. And, um, I, and it doesn't have to be at any specific age. Uh, Jack and I taught at Summerbridge. I felt like an adult at 16 mm -hmm. <laughs> because I felt really, really responsible mm -hmm. for what was happening. I was the uh, dean of students, right. and um, I, you know, I had to communicate with the, the parents and the students and the teachers about what was going on with the students, and that's pretty high-level adulting <laughs> at 16. So uh, maybe pretty young, um, I felt like an adult. But I think just adulting just means being responsible. And sometimes we get scared of the word responsibility. But it could come at any age. And maybe that's what everyone here is saying. So it doesn't matter when it comes, but you can feel it at different stages. I was wondering, how do you guys define success and if that changed from when you were at UHS to what it is now? My definition of success has definitely changed over time. Um, and I'm not, current, I'm not sure what it is right now. I think success is honestly if I can get more than five hours of sleep in a night and my son doesn't barf all over my shirt. But if you had asked me a couple years ago, I might have said, you know, having the respect of my colleagues and my clients and getting their kids the support that they need to make improvements in their development. It's not that the former definition has disappeared, it's just that it, for me, seems to be relative to whatever stage of my life I'm in at that moment. Um, yeah, and my, de my definition of success, I think, has also morphed over the years. Um, initially, it was, I'm going to graduate from college, I'm not moving home with my parents, I'm going to be financially independent, and I'm going to be an adult, right? Um, which I did, which was great. Um, and then after that, it was, well, my definition of success is I want my coworkers to respect me, in my opinion. Um, and then since then, it's morphed beyond that to um, I want to have a sense of satisfaction in the job that I do. I want to feel like I'm making a difference. Um, and or and you know maybe I want life balance. You know since then it's it definitely morphed again. So it's something that's constantly being redefined for me. Um, maybe in part because of where I am at different stages in my life. Um, about two years ago, I was taking care of a young guy in the hospital who was dying of liver disease from alcoholism. And he was originally from a small town outside of Mexico City. And he had been homeless in San Francisco and he'd recently been assaulted and hit all of his identification had been stolen. And he was here, he was undocumented in um, the United States. And because of the disease that he had of his liver, he was also very confused. And so he couldn't tell us any of his demographic information except for maybe his date of birth. But he did know that his brother lived in the East Bay. And he told us his name. And about mm, 10 days into the hospitalization, he decided he wanted to go home and to see his mother before he died. Um, and he was really confused and super sick and had no ID. And he was here undocumented <laughs> and he had no money. Um, and he had very little time on the order of days. And um, he, uh, we found his brother, <laughs> and then we found a friend of the family who happened to be going to Mexico City, just happened, and we um, bugged the Mexican consulate so many times that they not only gave him a copy of his passport, um, which they don't normally do uh, by fax, and they paid for the flight home. 
and we got him home, and he died uh, uh, in his own house with his mom. And he was able to spend time with his mom before he passed away. And uh, I think that, for me, is like, that's a, that, and I get to go home and hug my wife and my kids, that's success. Like, that's a great day. Um, no, that doesn't always happen, but, but that was a really good day. I was just going to say that um, I, m for me, my definition of success are two things. Uh, one is um, doing something with your life that you f feel is meaningful and that you feel like you're, for me personally, um, public service is meaningful and I, I really think that's um, worth my time. And second of all, working with people that you really makes work fun. Um, and how do you get there? How do you become successful? Um, I think that's challenging to think about. Um, so UHS is a great place to start because it's really challenging to, I think, get through this program. Um, but once you graduate from college, it's hard to define those goals. What are they going to be? You know, for different people, it'll be different. Um, for some people, it might be to learn a language or to get a black belt or to get another degree. Um, but when you're done with that, then you have to think even further. What are you going? What are going to be your goals? Because that's going to determine. But and you might not reach all, all the goals, and you may not be successful. And, and I think that part, of, part about being successful is everyone loves to talk about um, some of their successes, but they don't honestly talk too much about some of their failures. Um, and, uh, you know, when I was in high school, I, I remember I, I, I did track and field, and Jim Tracy, and I just saw there's, there's going to be a 5K race for him. You know, he taught us a lot of lessons about how to be successful. It was like working super hard and training every day. It didn't mean that you were going to win the race, but you're going to do the best you could. And um, yeah, I still do running. I do Ironman. I, 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 don't, I don't win, you know, but I, I do the best I can. And I think that's, that success is knowing, like, don't give up. Make sure you do the best you can and um, make sure you love what you do and work with people you want to be with. There are a lot of times when people say, I can't believe you have it all. And I, you know, I think all of us have probably heard that a few times from people. And you know, one response might be, oh, thank you. Another one then internally is like, huh, they think I have it all. <laughs> <laughs> and some of that is being, you know, I'm really lucky my mom and dad are still here in the Bay Area. I get to see them on a fairly regular basis. I did join my dad's ophthalmology practice so one measure of success was being able to say, good morning, Dad, each day in the office as a peer. And that was ridiculously cool. It doesn't seem so cool to just say, good morning, Mom, morning, Dad, right now, because you're doing it, you've been doing it every day of your 18-ish years. But then when you're in your 30s, it really is quite remarkable to be able to come back and do that. It's also a measure of success when I see my daughter take her dishes from the table and put them in the sink and say, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> there, just there's a lot of aspects of your life that you can be really grateful for, and I feel um, that just ha being able to appreciate what I have, and being so lucky to live here with all the privilege that we were born with in San Francisco, we have quality air and food and water. We have the opportunity to live. I mean, gosh, I think we were born successful, and it's a matter of just making the most of it. What makes you happy right now? Um. I I didn't answer the success question, but I think the two questions are, are kind of one and the same, which is what is the definition of success and what, what makes you happy in your life now? And I think for me, it, it echoes a lot of what's already been said here, but um, I think it's, it's less about external factors and it's more about how I feel about myself. And I think I very much learned through my experience at UHS and beyond to have a kind of lifelong love of learning. And for me, I also have kind of dabbled in triathlon and that was fun because it's, you know, I was learning three new sports more or less, um, doing something a little bit outside of my comfort zone, setting myself up for a challenge that I wasn't really sure I could complete, but doing, finding those things like triathlon throughout the course of your life. And it's also kind of wrapped into what is being an adult, you know, I never thought I'd find any joy in gardening. I thought that was something my mom did and it seemed like a lot of work and really boring. And now I'm cultivating things and it's very exciting and, and new and I'm having to learn the names of plants and what needs sun and what needs shade and all the stuff that seemed so mundane when I was your age. But now because it's new to me and I'm learning, it seems interesting and fun and exciting. So I think for me, just 
just being a constant learner is very fulfilling. And also my social relationships, working with people that I like, having my family nearby and engaging with them, even though I don't always love spending too much time with them. It's good to see them regularly. Um, but really fostering those relationships um, and making sure that I realize that my definition of happiness and success is very much wrapped into my network of friends and family.